And good morning again and welcome to Face the Nation. David Axelrod is the senior advisor to uh, uh, President Obama. Mr. Axelrod, let's just start with the headline news. And just when we thought the housing crisis, uh, which was, let us not forget, the beginning of our economic problems, just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, now we find that this sloppy paperwork by the lenders uh, may have made some of these foreclosures now that are being contemplated invalid. Some of the biggest lenders are now freezing foreclosures until they can get all this straightened out. I guess the first question I would have is, does the administration favor some kind of national moratorium on these foreclosures uh, to get this all sorted out? Well, first of all, Bob, it is a, a serious problem. It's thrown a lot of uncertainty into the housing market that, as you know, is already uh, fragile and it's and it's bad for the housing market. It's bad for these institutions, which is why they're scrambling mm -hmm. now to uh, to to go back and, and and through their documentation for all of this uh, as they should. The president was concerned enough to veto a bill that came to him last Thursday that would have unintentionally made it perhaps easier to make mistakes. Uh, and uh, so we are concerned. We're working with these institutions. Uh, I'm not sure about a national moratorium uh, because there are, in fact, valid foreclosures that, that, that probably should go forward uh, and uh, where the documentation and paperwork is, is proper. But we are working closely with uh, these uh, institutions to make sure that they expedite the process of going back and reconstructing uh, these and throwing out those that don't work. Well, I mean, I guess people are worried about what do you think the impact this is going to have on an economy that's pretty shaky right now anyway? Well, look, our hope is that this moves rapidly and that this gets unwound very, very quickly and that they, they, they can go back, reconstruct their paperwork. Uh, and what we've stressed to them is that they need to expedite that process and work very, very uh, quickly to get it done. And we're going to continue to uh, to push for that. Um, let's switch to politics. Last week, of course, the president's on the campaign trail. He's on the campaign trail uh, just virtually all the time now. Uh, and while he was out there, uh, the Democrats put out a an ad that's released this morning that blames the Republicans and specifically the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for injecting foreign money into campaigns. Uh, the president's words on the trail last week were, groups that receive foreign money are spending huge sums to influence American elections. Well, let's just look at this ad that the Democrats put out uh, today. Carl Rove, Ed Gillespie, their Bush cronies, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, their shills for big business, and they're stealing our democracy, spending millions from secret donors to elect Republicans to do their bidding in Congress. It appears they've even taken secret foreign money to influence our elections. It's incredible, Republicans benefiting from secret foreign money. Now, I wanna ask you about that because the New York Times uh, looked into the uh, chamber specifically and said the chamber really isn't uh, putting foreign money into the campaign, that it does charge its foreign affiliates dues that bring in less than $100,000 a year. A lot of organizations, including labor unions, do, do that. But the chamber has an annual budget of $200 million, and it says along with that, it keeps these foreign dues separate. They do spend heavily in politics, $25 million so far. They expect to spend $50 million. But this part about foreign money, uh, that appears to be peanuts, Mr. Axelrod. I mean, uh, do you have any evidence uh, that it's anything other than peanuts? Well, do you have any evidence that it's not, Bob? The fact is that the chamber has asserted that, but they won't release any information about where their campaign money is coming from. And that's at the core of the problem here. Uh, what we've seen in part because of a loophole that the uh, Supreme Court uh, allowed uh, earlier this year, we now see tens of millions of dollars being spent by the chamber and a, a number of organizations, some of which just cropped up. Ed Gillespie and Karl Rove won, uh, uh, run one of them. Uh, tens of millions of dollars from undisclosed donors under benign names like the American Crossroads Fund. Uh, and, they're, and they're spending heavily in all these elections. In one race in Colorado, uh, th there are six different organizations running negative ads against the Democratic senator there, Michael Bennett. No one knows where the money's coming from. So I guess my question back to you and for your next guest is, guest is, why not simply disclose where this money is coming from and then all of these questions will be answered? Well, that'll certainly be fine with me, but I, I want to go back to this thing about the, the Chamber of Commerce. If they're only taking in $100,000 a year... If they are... 
But you, uh, you question that. You well, say I don't they know. Mean. No one knows, Bob. The point is, you, they can, I can assert anything I want, but you have, as a good journalist, you'd ask me, well, how do we know that's true? Do you have documentation to prove that? If the chamber opens up his books and says, here's where our political money is coming from, here are the million dollar, or two million, or three million dollar contributions we've gotten from this company or that industry, uh, then we'll know. But until they do that, all we have is their assertion. Do you... I guess I would put it this way. If, if the only charge uh, three weeks into the election that the Democrats can make is that there's somehow this may or may not be foreign money coming into the campaign, uh, is that the best you can do? No, I think that uh, we have a, a, a more a fundamental concern, Bob, which is that the, the Republican Party and these interest groups who are now their, the, the major force in some of these campaigns want to turn the clock back to the very same policies that got us into this mess in the first place, that uh, exploded our deficits, that put the special interests in control or write their own rules, the oil industry, Wall Street, insurance industry, uh, that, uh, that presided over economic policies that punished the middle class, their incomes dropped by 5 percent during the, the eight years before we got here, and that ultimately crashed our economy. And now they want to turn the clock back to those policies, and we just can't afford to do that. But these this, this issue of this special interest spending is very important. It's never happened before that, that, that uh, organizations are spending this kind of money. And, and the American people need to ask, why, are the, why, is, the, why, are, the, why is the oil industry, the uh, Wall Street and others, spending this kind of money to defeat candidates and elect others in this, in this sort of secretive uh, way? And, uh, you know, that is, a, that is a threat to our democracy. What do you uh, think would happen, uh, Mr. Axelrod, if the Republicans do take the House? Because more and more analysts are saying it looks like that's going to happen. Uh, do you believe it'll force Democrats and Republicans to start working together, or do you see something more gridlock, perhaps? Well, well let me say, I don't, you know, I don't think that that is going to be the outcome of the election. But my hope is that you will see more cooperation. As you know, Bob, the, the, uh, the uh, posture of the Republican Party from the moment we got here has been basically to deprive the president of bipartisan support so they could accuse him of not being uh, bipartisan the day uh, uh, that the president went up to talk to the Republican caucus about the Recovery Act uh, in the House, uh, they issued a release on on the way up on his on his way up to the Hill, saying they weren't going to give him one vote uh, at a time when we had a national crisis that w that we needed to uh, address. So I'm hoping that with more seats. Uh, the Republicans will feel a greater sense of responsibility to work with us to solve some of these problems. I, I'm told you've become a serious student of the Tea Party. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton said the other day that Sarah Palin is a force to be reckoned with. So what do you make of Sarah Palin? Do you take her seriously? Well, she certainly has a following. Uh, and she's an interesting personality. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to pass judgment on, uh, on the, the, the level of, of force she represents in our politics, but she has, you know, when she sends out uh, a tweet on Twitter uh, or puts something on her Facebook, uh, you guys cover it, people respond to it, uh, and so that makes her a, a player in our politics. And the Tea Party itself. Do you believe, uh, as some Democrats do, uh, that it is simply a motivator for Democrats? Well, I think some of the positions that some of the Tea Party supported candidates have taken, eliminating Social Security, eliminating uh, Medicare, eliminating the Department of Education, uh, uh, dismantling laws to protect our air and water. Uh, these are not positions that most Americans support. Certainly, uh, most Democrats don't support that. And I think that is motivating. I don't discount the impulse of millions of people who have supported these candidates who are frustrated with uh, some of the things that they've seen over the years here in Washington and who are frustrated with the, uh, with the economy. But I don't think, uh, what's interesting is you've got a Republican Party that's sort of bifurcated between those rank and file people who have that impulse and these sort of corporate Republicans here who are kind of factotums for special interest. The day of the Tea Party convention in, um, in Nashville, John Boehner was up on Wall Street 
telling the the big uh, finance houses there that he was the only one who stood between them and financial reform. Well, I don't think, and that they should give him millions of dollars, which they apparently are. Uh, I don't think that's what those folks bargained for, but that's, uh, that's where we are. Let me ask you a final question. When John Boehner, the Republican leader of the House, was here, I asked him, I said, uh, talking about things where the two sides could work together, I said, why don't you and the president announce jointly that the two of you will pledge to try to stop smoking? Uh, he said he'd take it under consideration or thank me for the suggestion. Do you think the president would be willing to join in some kind of a campaign like well, that? Well, you know, we sort of started that campaign, Bob, because we, we waged a big battle in the Congress to get the FDA to regulate tobacco so that we could stop the marketing of these products to but children. But he still smokes. Mi yeah, but Mr. the president has uh, is doing a pretty good job on that, by the way. But, but the bigger issue is this. They can be role models for sure, but if we allow the tobacco companies to market their products to children, then we're creating a whole new generation of people who are addicted to tobacco. That's why we waged that fight. Mr. Boehner and the Republican Party were on the other side of that fight. But what about just a pledge, the two of them working together? Do you think the president would consider something like well, that? Well, I think Mr. we, we want to work together on any constructive right. thing we can. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Axelrod, for being with us. Good to be us. with you.